The Dow topped 16,000. Is there anything else we can possibly talk about? You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. It is Monday. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This here is David Hansen. David, we are coming up on the anniversary of JFK's assassination. Mm -hmm. Christian Science Monitor had a headline today. It read, 50 years after JFK, conspiracy theories of all sorts thrive in America. David, what is your favorite conspiracy theory? Moon landing. I moon love landing. the moon landing conspiracy. I love it especially because, who was it, Buzz Aldrin, when someone was like, you didn't really land on the moon, and he punched him in the face. That was like <laughs> the best thing ever. That is and a that, good response. that fed all of the conspiracy theories. They're like, see, look, he's, he's so mad. He has no response. Him. So that's my favorite. What about you? Area 51. And, and, and because I don't believe it's really a conspiracy, I think it is just there are aliens there. I just tacitly assume that. So I don't have to get fired up about it or anything like that. I just know there are aliens there. So let's move on. Well, Will Smith's been there. So if he's well, been there, it's got to be. I mean, sure. there's a documentary on it, right? Yes. <laughs> Independence Day. That was a documentary, I thought. But maybe I'm wrong. All right. Let's get to the real headlines here. Although that was a real headline. Uh, first one is from Wall Street Journal. We've got Dow top 16,000 as U.S. stocks climb. There it is. 16,000, David. We've, we've, got, we've done it. Mission, what else? <laughs> Mission accomplished. Let's Mission, go home. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Let's just shut down the podcast. This is done. So there's 16,000 for the first time ever. Can, can we still invest? Yes, this is... We're at nosebleed levels. 16, every, everybody's going to talk about it. We're talking about it. It's the headline. 16,000 everywhere. Everything was okay at 15,999, <laughs> but at 16,000, stocks are too expensive. It highlights one of the biases we talk about, anchoring bias. People look at a price and say, that's the right price. People look at Apple all the time. I know that's not a, a company we talk about a lot, but people say, well, it was at 700, so it's going to get back to 700. It's just an arbitrary price, an arbitrary number. It's an anchoring bias that a lot of people can't avoid. It's kind of just inherent in our behavioral way we interact with finance and, and with the markets there. So it's a big number, whatever. I'm going to throw out a phrase that a lot of people don't like. Do you think this is a stock picker's market? Sure. <laughs> Every market's a stock picker's market. I mean, that's that's what we're we're trying to do here. We're trying to find good companies and... Yes, you can, you can look at the macro, you can look at the overall market, but that doesn't mean you should go home and stop looking for good buys. So. I, I, think it's, I think it's about, I agree with you, I think it's about knowing yourself. Are you a passive investor who's going to be in index funds, looking for low-cost index funds to own over the long term? If you are, do that. Keep mm -hmm. doing that. Don't try to, don't, don't jump back and forth. I don't like calling people active investors because it makes it sound too much like you're trading in and out. But if you are more of a stock picker looking for, like you said, good businesses, do that. There's, there's, there are still values to be had in this market, and of course, particularly in our sector. There you go. All right, moving on to the second headline, talking about some of these companies from Bloomberg. BlackRock set for final clash with AIG on Bank of America deal. That's a lot of company names in the headline there, and this is referring to the 2011 proposed settlement between Bank of America and Bank of New York Mellon, who is the trustee for all these investors and mortgage-backed securities. The 8.5 billion dollar settlement, very big settlement at the time. BlackRock wants it to go through, PIMCO wants it to go through, Goldman Sachs wants, Goldman Sachs wants it to go through, AIG and a couple other guys don't want it to go through. Mm -hmm. And this is finally wrapping up. This has been going on, like I said, since 2011. I believe it when Supposedly, I see it. Supposedly uh, going into the closing arguments here on why it should go through. Hopefully this gets done. It would be once it's done, it, it's a good thing for everyone involved. It, it's the biggest deal for Bank Unless of America. Unless you're AIG, obviously, I don't think it's a good... Well, well, yeah, if it doesn't get through for them. But even AIG shareholder, I'm, I'm one. If this, this just gets another thing off their checklist, I'd rather them focus on the business, not have to deal with these other headlines, these other things going on. So once it's done, I think it's good for everybody. Do you agree? I, I guess that's... Yeah, I guess that's fair. From, from B of A's perspective... Uh, in their investors' perspective, it's a matter of certainty versus not. I, th I think the question that, that Bank of America investors are asking themselves, what happens if this doesn't go through? The, the $8.5 billion settlement's on the table. The $8.5 billion has already been set aside. Yep. So if this is agreed to, that's not an $8.5 billion that we'll see run through the P&L. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just going to now be paid out. If it's not, if this settlement isn't reached, then... I can't think of a scenario where the, the eventual payout will be less than the 8.5 mm -hmm. billion. So I think it would be certainly bad news if AIG and its cohort uh, win. From AIG's perspective, I, you know, I, I don't see 
harm in, in trying to get more money out of it. I'm an AIG shareholder too. And, and I like to point out the fact that when we look at the cheap big banks, they're the subject of lawsuits. When we look at cheap AIG, it's pursuing a lot of lawsuits, which I think is an interesting difference and something you don't want to overlook. Exactly. Third headline, we're going back to Bloomberg. For a little Bitcoin, U.S. agencies say Bitcoins offer legitimate benefits. This is the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission both throwing their weight behind Bitcoin, saying that it, what was it, 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 it saying that it was a, that it's a legitimate financial instrument. This is huge for Bitcoin, and it was huge for the yes, price. You were telling huge. me last week you were thinking about picking up a few Bitcoins yourself. What happened? I was there? I was tossing the idea around. <laughs> I'm not certainly not putting any money that I need in the immediate future into a Bitcoin. I don't own any, uh, but it is interesting to see them come out and somewhat legitimize. I don't think they're throwing their whole weight behind this idea. I don't think they're ready to ditch the U.S. dollar. And oh, yeah, yeah, Bitcoin. that's what I thought it was. Oh, that was the proposal? Yeah, getting rid of the dollar, um, only Bitcoins from now on. I don't know how, how Bitcoins... Bitcoins and shark's teeth. I don't, I don't know the, the future of Bitcoin. It's either I think it's either going to be something really big or nothing at all. I don't think there's going to be a, a whole lot of in-between here with Bitcoin. But things like, the, things like this, these statements come out, it does legitimize it a little bit, which helps it. I mean, it's a little bit of a confidence game here in terms of people trusting Bitcoin, thinking it's a legitimate currency or store of value. So anything that, that legitimizes it in any way, you're going to see that react in the, in the price. And we saw it jump from around $400 of Bitcoin to $600 of Bitcoin today. So that's a very, very huge jump. So it's, a, it's an interesting story. I mean, we, look at the, we have the graph here, and it's basically just going parabolic here. It's, the, the market value of Bitcoin now is is around six and six and a half billion dollars, U.S. dollars. There. The Bloomberg article points out that the currency value is up thirty-fold this year, and and referring back to that graph, I mean, you can see it in that graph basically. But one of the things that I'll point out is that when you think about it as a currency, and that's what a lot of people are trying to argue that it is, that is not a very effective currency. When the value of a currency goes up thirty x mm -hmm. in the course of a year, that is a massive amount of deflation. Right. And that does not make uh, handling it and using it for any sort of, obviously for store of value, but, but for transactions, for paying people, for, for buying and selling goods and services, that would make for a very unstable economy. Yeah, I think my favorite story is I, I read one guy paid for a couple pizzas with four or five Bitcoins, and now those are pretty expensive pizzas. Exactly. All right, moving on to our focus for today. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about The Outsiders. The, this, is a, this is a book, a very, very good book by William Thorndike. Uh, it's called The Outsiders. I think we've got a picture of it here. Oh, and you've got, all the, you, you got us all of the pricing information. So you can get it on Amazon. Multiple, for $17, yep. Yeah, for, or, or the Kindle version for 15 there Why would you, you get it in paper? Do you hate trees? I like paper. A anyway, <laughs> the, the Outsiders. I have a. I should say I have a paper copy on my desk because the Kindle copy was the Kindle version was not available. One of the key themes in the Outsiders is capital allocation, and in layman's terms, capital allocation is just the idea of a CEO taking all of the cash that a company earns and deciding on the best way to put that back to work. And what we would think of for most companies is you earn cash. And you reinvest it back in the business. You buy things you need for the business, whether it be machines or buy other companies. Mm -hmm. You can make acquisitions with it. You can hire more workers and spend more money on, on employees and that sort of thing. You can build a, a nicer headquarters for whatever that'll do for you. But there are other things you can do with the cash as well. You can buy back shares. You can pay dividends. Uh, like I said, you could acquire other companies. And so the idea is having a CEO that is dead focused on finding the highest returns available to put that cash to work. Because you can plow all of your cash back into the business, but all of that cash may not produce an acceptable return to shareholders. And at some point, you may need to think about, well, this business isn't going to do it anymore, so either I should just give this money back to shareholders in the form of dividends, or I can buy give it back to shareholders in the form of uh, buybacks mm -hmm. when that's a good idea when, when the valuation is, is proper on the stock. Or you can start diversifying out into other lines of business where you can deploy that cash in, uh, and, and get good returns for it. One of, the, there aren't, I don't think there are many of the companies available 
Um, I should have gone back and, and looked at this, but I, one that I wanted to key in on of the eight profiles that Thorndike does in this book, one that is definitely still available for investors to in, invest in today is uh, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that Buffett, I mean, going way back to when Berf Buffett first bought Berkshire, this was a textile business, a struggling textile business that was producing accounting losses, but a, producing a whole lot of cash. So instead of trying to plow that cash back into a failing textile business, Buffett put that to work elsewhere. And he's been doing that consistently over decades. Yeah. And, and this is investing it into buying other businesses. So he bought Geico altogether, bought uh, a bunch of different insurance operations. A few years ago, bought an entire uh, National Railroad, or w one of the largest railroads in the country, uh, has bought Dairy Queen, has bought Seas Candies, has bought a number of things, and is also known for investing in, in publicly traded stocks. So Buffett is a great example of a CEO who is very focused on this capital allocation question. Yeah, and I think the best thing to do if someone's sitting there today and saying, okay, how can I find someone who's doing this? This sounds great. I'd love to have someone that allocates my, my capital to the best possible scenario. I think the thing you have to do is look at the track record. That's really the only way you can do it because anyone can come out and say, we're buying back stock. This is why, this is why we think it's a great move for our company. But you really don't know if that's a successful allocation and further down the road. Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing you can do is kind of look back at the history and say, well, who's actually done that? And the, the CEOs that he profiles in the book they don't do it for just a, a one year span and then they're done. It's right. a lifetime right, of doing exactly. this stuff. So just because a CEO has been successful and the stock's done well over the last 10 years or so, that doesn't mean it, it's all going to be over. They, they've shown the ability to, to allocate efficiently. And one that popped out to me in, a, in our sector was U.S. Bancorp. And when we look at, that, look at kind of share buybacks and share count through the last eight or so years, mm -hmm. from 2005, U.S. Bancorp only has... 1% more shares than they did in 2005. And that's coming out of the, one of the biggest financial crises ever, where we saw Citigroup have 5x the amount of shares, Bank of America 2x the amount of shares there. So when you look at someone like Richard Davis, he obviously understands the business. He has a track record of keeping the share count low, allocating capital efficiently. So I think that's one you can look at and say, yeah, I feel pretty confident that this guy is going to put my money where it needs to be. I have already mentioned one example of an insurer then in Buffett and Berkshire, like I said, it was mentioned specifically, was profiled specifically in The Outsiders. I think another one, which was modeled on Buffett and Berkshire, is Markel. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Gaynor over at Markel uh, is doing a very, a very similar thing to, to Buffett, except that in this case, they started with an insurance operation. So they still have the opportunity to uh, reinvest capital in the insurance operation. So when insurance rates are right and they think they can get a good return on that, they put capital work in the insurance business. Mm -hmm. They just acquired a whole other insurance business, Altera, which focuses a lot on reinsurance. So now the company can allocate capital into the reinsurance business. Uh, Tom Gaynor has shown a, a knack, we'll say, for investing in, in public companies mm -hmm. over the years, return, uh, earning great returns, so they can invest in publicly traded companies. And finally, they have a, a little arm called Markel Ventures, which buys entire other companies, smaller companies, mm -hmm. and they can allocate capital there. So I think this is a developing story. It's, I'm, Markel's not a new company, but it's still fairly small, by, per, specifically by mm -hmm. comparison to Berkshire. So I think there's a long runway here that uh, that Markel can continue to be a good example. Of yeah, I'm, sort of I'm glad you mentioned the Altera acquisition too, because another thing that he mentions in the book is a lot of these CEOs and, and a lot of these companies, they do go out and make a huge acquisition, and that can be kind of an inflection point for the business going forward. A lot of people, uh, we saw the market reaction when Markel acquired Altera, the stock got terrible. got crushed. That's when I bought it. Because um, <laughs> it, it was an enormous acquisition, right. and, and the book is saying that's not always bad. A lot of these times, people, uh, executives, companies see these opportunities, make really big decisions, and that can be the catalyst that, that drives them forward. So Outsiders, great book. A definite recommendation mm -hmm. for viewers and listeners to pick that up and, and give it a read. And, and in the meantime, Berkshire Hathaway, U.S. Bancorp, and Markel, maybe good examples of, of capital allocation at work. Yep. Uh, heading over to the mailbag, we've got uh, another question here. I'll say quickly first, you can email us at WTMI at fool.com. Uh, we love to get questions, comments, whatever you have to say, WTMI at fool.com. Today's question from Ruth. I just added NLY, that's Annalie, that's the ticker symbol for Annalie Capital, to my watch list after hearing about it on your podcast. However, 
While reading up on Annalee, I found a couple shockingly bad articles about this company. Those were shockingly bad articles from The Fool, I should say. What are your thoughts? Has your thesis changed? These execs sound pretty awful. They weren't shockingly poorly written. Oh, no, no, they, they, were, were, they were wonderfully they written. Were wonderfully they were wonderfully written. They written by, by John Maxfield, one, mm -hmm. of our, one of our great banking and financial services uh, writers here at The Fool. Mm -hmm. And what do, you, what do you say? What do you think? So, so we just talked about management uh, that's, that's great, that makes you feel good. Annalie's not one of them. Uh, I'm a shareholder. Full disclosure, you don't, you don't want to snuggle up with their management team, per se. I mean, th they've been some ethical issues-ish in, in the past. Nothing illegal, um, but... It's more walking the line. Yeah, more walking the line. And they recently externalized their management, which basically means the business is now managed by an external company, and we can't really see much into that. We can't see how much they're paying the CEO anymore. We can't see how much they're paying other executives at the company. So that doesn't make you feel good. But as a shareholder, I look to the actual performance track record, and I think that speaks for itself. They've been able to deliver for shareholders three different cycles over the years. So we talk about great management teams here at The Fool and wanting to feel good about conscious capitalism and appeasing all stakeholders. Maybe this isn't one for you if you were looking for companies that only do that, but I think the actual performance of the management team maybe justifies some of those ethical gray lines. I don't know about justifies. Well, he, here's, here's what we should do. For, for viewers and listeners, just so we're all on the same page, our uh, Twitter address is TMF Financials. That's at TMF Financials. We can go ahead and tweet out both of those articles that Ruth is uh, referring to. I, John Maxfield, who wrote the articles, I don't totally disagree with John, uh, similar to what you're saying. There have been some questionable, questionable things that Annalise management has done. The pay at Annalie for the executives has been very, very high in the past. And I don't think that that's totally unreasonable. This is very much like a hedge fund business. And so the people are the assets there. And the kind of pay packages look, look bad when you stack them up against a lot of other companies. But when you stack them up against a hedge fund, which is really what this is, they don't look all that high. The externalization of the management company, there may be some question marks around that, but it's not. It's it's actually more the standard practice right. in the mortgage re, uh, industry than not. Um, I'm not saying that that necessarily justifies it, but it's not like Annalie is doing something very different from everybody else. And finally, and and this is this is in in a bit of a, a nod to what you were saying. The mortgage rates are a jockey play. It's it's all about who's managing this portfolio. And the folks at the top of uh, Mike Farrell, b before he passed away, uh, he's a, he was a guy who knew the, the mortgage bond market very, very well. Uh, Wellington Denahan Norris, who's running uh, the company now, uh, has had been working with Farrell for a long, long time. And she does as well. And uh, so, uh, you, you know, for better or for worse, I think these are the kind of people you want to be following on a mortgage rate. Um, but, but it's not a, for everyone. Keep a close eye. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Not for everyone. And keep a close eye on what they're doing, I guess mm -hmm. I'd say. Yep. All right. All right. The game for the day. We've got a little making the grade. And in this, we are going to present a few scenarios or a couple scenarios mm -hmm. and then draw some beautiful pictures illustrating our view on the scenario. David, first one. Selling Bank of America because you've doubled your money. What's your, what's your rendition of that, uh, what's your artist's rendering of the reaction to that? That doesn't look very artistic. Not very artistic, but I'm gonna give that a, a D plus, but down in the corner there, it's a, it's a depends. Um, depends on like your the, situation. Like, like a diaper? <laughs> not, like an adult. not a diaper, no. Uh, um, so D plus, <laughs> based on only that, that you doubled your money, any time, whether it's Bank of America, uh, doesn't really matter that it doubled. I think you still have to always revisit the stock and revisit the valuation saying, what does it look like from here? In my opinion, I think Bank of America still has potential upside if they can hit some of their new BAC goals, uh, continuing to streamline the business there. So I would say not a very good idea to sell it just because it doubled. But if, but if you're an older person and you're, you're not comfortable with the landscape going forward, you're nearing retirement, I think you can justify, I made a good profit here, I want the cash, then I could sell. So that's my depends there. What do you say? <laughs> Depends. Can't get over that. All right, I've got a picture here of a guy. This this guy's really confused. He's looking around. He's got all the question marks over his head. And then over here, this is the point. He's missing the point. Okay. He's looking everywhere around, and he's missing the point. 
the reason that we're that we're investing, the reason that we're buying these companies, isn't just so we can say, oh, this stock went up a whole bunch, so we're going to turn around and sell it. I leave that for the day traders, the, the, the day traders, the swing traders, the short-term, mid-term traders, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they're looking to to get stock appreciation and then say, well, I've made a lot of stock appreciation. This stock has gone up a lot, so I'm mm -hmm. going to sell it. Uh, the idea for us, the idea for me, is to find a company that I believe is worth more than the value that the market is putting on it. And right now for Bank of America, even though the stock has gone up a lot, I still think the value of the company is greater than what's in the, uh, the, what the market is saying. There you go. Scenario number two. David, go ahead. Scenario number two, talking a little bit mortgage REITs and BDCs. Making the grade, buying BDCs and mortgage REITs strictly for the big dividends. You going first on this? Sure. I've got an easy one. So, of course, BDCs, mortgage REITs, they have to pass on their income to shareholders. BDCs, They're most business of it. development companies. Business development companies. It's kind of a private equity Get, type business. Getting a little jargony on it. Um, so, yeah, what do you say? Big dividends. Shark fin. <laughs> That's a shark fin. When you, when you jump in the water and you're just looking at these big dividend yields and saying, oh, 12%. Well, you can't go wrong with that. Well, yes, you actually can. You can go very wrong with 12%. Because the, the, the dividend yield is based on the price of the stock. It's based on the ability of the company to keep paying the dividend that it's paying. I think the problem is, is that a lot of uh, people from past experience have gotten fixated on the idea of dividends like a Johnson & Johnson dividend. The way Johnson & Johnson pays a dividend, it has a very, 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 very stable business. Mm -hmm. And it's able to take a bunch of its cash flow, pay it out as a dividend, raise that dividend a little bit every year, and investors can count on that dividend year after year after year. That's not the case with BDCs. That's not the case with mortgage REITs. Mm -hmm. And so it's very dependent on the market environment and, and what the mortgage rate is able to pay out. I'm with you. I'm giving that a 1 out of 10. I'm not getting very creative today, but it's a Monday. So I'm allowed to. <laughs> 1 out of 10. It's fine for that to get on your radar. You just can't draw as well as me. Just, yeah, that's, you that's really what it is. It's fine for that to get on your radar. That's the reason why. But you have to understand what these businesses are doing. They do a lot of different things. BDCs invest in a lot of different types of companies, whether they're giving loans, whether they're making equity investments in, in small startups there and other private companies. Mortgage REITs, we've talked about them in the past, that a lot of different stuff goes on there. I will give uh, listeners and viewers a couple BDCs, business development companies, to put on their radar. Mm -hmm. I was talking with one of our analysts, Jordan Wathen, who covers this sector pretty extensively. He said two to put on your watch list are Aries Capital, who's the biggest player in that space. They get some pretty advantageous borrowing costs. The ticker there is ARCC, okay. so Aries Capital. And the other one was Main Street Capital, um, another big dividend pair. And the ticker there is MAIN, Main. Um, so those are two to put on your radar. If you're interested in learning about this space that offers big dividends, check out Jordan Wathen's articles and also put these on your watch list. All right, closing out, going to the Twitter sphere. David, what's our first tweet? First tweet, AIG, back in the headlines. This is from Zachary Tracer. He says, the group trying to buy AIG's plane leasing unit may have some new members. So hopefully for AIG shareholders, as you and I both are, this deal goes through. It's been kind of hanging over the company for a while, trying to sell it to a group of Chinese investors here. There's been some hiccups, I guess we can say. Definitely some hiccups along the way here. Apparently, they have some new financing members. Maybe it looks like this could go through sooner rather than later. Are you optimistic? I'm, I'm not. I, I wouldn't say that I'm terribly optimistic on it, on it going through because of this. Uh, what I will say is I don't, I don't see this as any sort of race against the clock. I like the idea that the AIG divests this business because it's not core to AIG's business. But this is, this is the, uh, a huge aircraft, uh, aircraft leasing business. This is a valuable business. Mm -hmm. So whether this group buys it, um, which they'd probably be lucky to buy it. Uh, if this group buys it, that's great. If AIG has to go through the IPO process, uh, that drags out the process a little bit more, but I think that that'll deliver value to AIG shareholders. Yeah, well. not, not super material to the long-term It's a good AIG business. Cases. It's not like it's, yeah, it's not like it's gonna blow up in the, in the meantime, there so you. I'm not too worried about it. Tweet number two. We've got Epicurean Dealmaker. That's at Epicurean Deal. He says, oh goody. The current draft of the Volcker rule, including edits, spans about a thousand pages. David, is this your weekend reading for next weekend? My, I'm taking this home for Christmas break and I'm just going to digest that Volcker rule. You can get through it in a day, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. While opening presents with everyone, I'll be reading the Volcker rule. Um, 
banks, investment banks, they're not sitting on their hands waiting for this to be finalized. We look at Goldman Sachs. By the time this finally gets done and completely minted, I guess, mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs is going to be basically done implementing all the changes that need to be done. I mean, that's not just Goldman. It's happening all over Wall Street. They're exiting some private equity deals. They're ex exiting hedge fund deals. So the banks are doing what they need to do. It's up to the regulators to kind of finalize everything. But investors shouldn't be worried here, in my opinion. We're, we're supporters. We're, we're, I, I shouldn't put it in that way, but, but we talk a lot about banks here, and, and we're, we're in favor of banks as businesses uh, on this show. But when you think about any sort of regulation getting done, any sort of success we can talk about from the vocal rule, it being a thousand pages, I, I have to think that there are roughly 998 loopholes in that thousand pages. I'm sure Goldman will find them too. Yeah. All right, All right, final tweet of the day. Going back to the world of Bitcoin, this is from Daniel Gross. He is at GrossDM. Subway in Allentown. That's Subway the restaurant in Allentown. I know, it's I, I, Bitcoin. I, 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 so you can use mystery currency to pay for your mystery meat. Now, not to throw you under the bus here, but this has got to make you really excited, David, because I know that you have Subway nearly every day for Every lunch. day? That's exaggerated. It, it's pretty close. You, the $5 or, foot long is a good deal. Let's establish <laughs> that. Well, but how many Bitcoin is the foot long? I'm, I'm going to have to do the math. So it's 600 We'll figure it out. I got to get my Bitcoin and then I can pay. All right, you can, you can, you can put it up on Twitter. And, and that, that reminds me, uh, viewers and listeners can tweet us at TMF Financials. Are you going to buy Bitcoin so that you can hopefully pay for your future Subway sandwiches? In I don't think I would do it because I don't want that $5 foot long to turn into like a $5 million foot long 20 years <laughs> down the road. So how, maybe how, I'll buy the Bitcoin. How, how soon is it that Subway will be paying RG3 in Bitcoin for the advertisement? Oh man, he's having a rough year. He probably will need it. Well, it's hopefully they paid him before so he got to ride the Bitcoin. <laughs> there you go. For his, for his sake. All right, that is the show for today. Thanks for joining us, folks. Uh, you can tweet us at TMF Financials. You can email us, WTMI at fool.com. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This over here is David Hansen, and we'll see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.